Thank you all for uh, for coming uh, to this first uh, the first presentation of today. I know it's tough. Uh, I'm not. Uh, um, I have troubles waking up early regularly, so I appreciate all of you being here. And well, um, well, my name is Gustavo Silva, and uh, we are going to be talking about uh, a little bit about security, uh, the Linux kernel, and uh, the implications of. Uh, well, implementing security upstream in the upstream Linux, Linux kernel, which is uh, well, is, uh, is is tough. <laughs> well, uh, first a couple of disclaimers. Uh, this is the first time I'm going to give this presentation, so uh, you are going to be my test audience. So I appreciate that. So hopefully I'm going to get a pass at the end. And um, another disclaimer is that well, usually. Uh, the person that uh, speaks about the kernel cell protection project is Case Cook, which is uh, the person that uh, created the project in 2015. Uh, so, of course, he has all the credentials. Um, and well, I'm going to give uh, this presentation from my from my own particular perspective, right? I have been collaborating with this project for uh, some years now, so uh, I, I I have not uh, all the experience that Case have, but uh, that Case has, but um, I'm going to going to give it a try. And well, first, before before I even begin, uh, let me ask you a couple of questions just to have an idea of, of the audience present today. So, how many of you here um, started uh, his uh, career in the kernel uh, community uh, in since 2017? Ah, come on. <laughs> From from 2007, yeah, yeah, no, no. <laughs> okay, how many again, please? Oh, a few. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, well, the, the reason for this question is because well, I started uh, participating and collaborating with this community in uh, in May 2017. So, well, I I'm still new. So, well, the second question is how many here have uh, have heard before about the kernel self protection project? Okay, awesome. Well, a lot of you uh, actually, uh, it seems you don't know what we are doing in the current production project, but this presentation is for that. And well, okay. So first, who am I? Um, well, I have a background in embedded systems. Um, I have experience working with uh, real-time operating systems and embedded Linux. So before I joined the kernel community, I was uh, an embedded software engineer for eight years. So now I have uh, been doing uh, uh, upstream Linux kernel development for the last six years. Uh, I'm now recently I am a maintainer. And well, I collaborate with the Google Open Source Security team in the kernel division. Well, I had to say that uh, uh, this presentation is, is, is made possible thanks to the support of the Linux Foundation and Google. And well, I am a volunteer uh, at Kids on Computers. I was a board member and now I volunteer occasionally. Uh, but later on, I, I guess uh, in the day, we are going to talk a little bit more about this project. And well, this is um, Tuxote. <laughs> Tuxote was my, my support, uh, uh, how, how do you call this? Uh, emotional support, stuffed animal during the pandemic. So <laughs> it was, a, it was a, a special gift. So, um, okay, the agenda. Uh, of course, we are going to talk uh, about the kernel self protection project, what it is and what it is not, uh, some of the tools and platforms we regularly use, uh, and also uh, what it takes to, to actually harden the Linux kernel, right? And then, well, I'm going to share a little bit about the work in progress uh, currently in uh, some. A few accomplishments, uh, mostly what I am involved in too. So, and well, I'm going to try to uh, to persuade some of you or some people that is uh, watching this presentation out there at some point um, on on collaborating with us uh, to improve the overall security of the Linux kernel. And I'm going to try to explain how you can do uh, how you can uh, do some changes to the code that are important to accomplish some 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 goals. And well, finally, the conclusions. 
Ok, uh, first, uh, the Linux kernel cell, protect, the, the kernel cell protection project is, uh, is an upstream project and I have to clarify this because on IRC, every now and then, uh, we, we get some, some messages uh, from people asking uh, where is the, 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 the repository of, the, of, of this project, where can they go and take a look and try to uh, uh, and, and test it or, or try it out. Um, we don't have a, a repository. Uh, we don't have a clone. We, we are not a clone of the Linux kernel. We are not a downstream project. Every, everything we do, every, uh, every major or minor, uh, minor middle step we implement uh, is supposed to, uh, to go upstream. So everything we do uh, is for the upstream Linux kernel. And well, of course, uh, we uh, focus our efforts on hardening the Linux kernel. So now, usually when people uh, talk about or read about hardening, hardening software, the next thing they, they, they read or, or they hear is that, well, hardening is about uh, making the, in this case, the kernel harder to attack or making some particular software harder to attack. Uh, I don't usually, I don't like that, uh, that, that explanation because to me it's a little bit shallow, it's a little bit too general. Uh, what we are trying to do in this project is to, uh, to do whatever is possible in order to get rid of entire bug classes, right? And ultimately, the, the ultimate goal and in, in what would be just amazing is to eliminate uh, methods of exploitation, right? And also, I have to add here that we are not um, we are not working on fixing uh, box, you know, on, on hunting and fixing box. Uh, we have decided to focus our efforts on on trying to implement defense mechanisms, trying to implement safer APIs, trying to identify some buggy code patterns, some idioms that people have been using for decades, and, uh, and trying to replace them with, uh, with, um, with something a little bit more secure and less prone to errors, right? Uh, however, addressing bugs and issues, uh, individual bugs and issues is still important, so uh, whenever you can do that, it's great. And of course, well, we are trying to move the whole code base to, uh, to safer APIs. And well, I have to uh, say a word about CVEs. Um, we are not uh, we are not writing CVEs. And why do I even mention CVEs? Well, that's because a little bit more than a year ago, uh, there was this uh, press release from announcing a collaboration between Google and the Linux Foundation. And they were announcing that they were funding some um, a couple of developers to focus exclusively on, on security in the Linux kernel. Well, those people happened to be Nathan uh, Chancellor and I. And well, at that time, uh, some people started to ask if, uh, well, now it was a good time for, for the kernel people to start uh, paying attention to CVEs. And well, the short answer is no. We, we don't write CVEs. Uh, we don't care about CVEs. Uh, so we decided to uh, to spend our time on, on other stuff, on, on things that we consider a little bit more important than CVs, than, than writing CVs. I understand that for, for certain sector of the software industry, CVs are important, but at least in, in our case, they are not. Okay, well, some tools and platforms we regularly use. We have a, a Linux hardening mailing list now. It was recently created in 2020, and that was because at some point, Case had some disagreements with uh, uh, some of the of the admins of the other mailing of the other kernel hardening list. And the thing is that it seems that uh, they didn't want to uh, to see other things that uh, I mean, that they only wanted to see new things landing in that list. They only wanted to see discussions about, uh, I don't know, maybe some important inno innovations, and it's something they wanted only to see like a list of all the small middle steps uh, are absolutely needed in order to achieve bigger goals. They only wanted to see a list of that things being completed, but they didn't want to, to see discussion about it because they considered that uh, in unimportant. 
So we need a list where we could discuss about those unimportant things, which are actually uh, absolutely important for us. And, and well, uh, Case created this new list. Uh, there is a link at the end, so you can go and see the whole discussion. It's somewhat a long, a long discussion, but it's interesting to read. Um, and yeah, well, we we needed this. Um, we we also have to do in order to um, to let's say to enable a compiler option. Uh, we need to do a lot of cleanups uh, along the way. So sometimes we need to deal with mechanical changes. So all those things that even if they appear small and simple, uh, well, we need a, a place where we could talk about it. So. Patchwork, well, of course, uh, the, the project is not a subsystem, but somehow we have maintainers, and uh, well, the maintainers are Case and I. And well, we need a place where we could uh, collect all the important uh, tags, the review bytes, the tested bytes, the acknowledge. And well, now the project has been growing, and we eventually get some, uh, some, some contributors, some external contributors to the project. Uh, some occasional contributors. And in the past, when we didn't have uh, the patchwork project, well, some of those patches uh, were lost. Even some of our patches were lost. I mean, uh, sometimes we were sending a bunch of patches, and by a bunch of patches, I mean like uh, more than a 100. Uh, and then after some months, we ran into a piece of code that looked familiar, and well, it turned out that those patches that we were sending were, were never applied, and we forgot about them. So, yeah, we wanted to uh, we wanted to avoid that, and and that's uh, that's why we use patchwork is very useful. And well, another thing about uh, occasional contributors. Um, every now and then, uh, contributors appear, and their patches are lost, and so. But every now and then, something funny happens that. We see uh, contributions with uh, with a copy paste commit log, and that's interesting for us. And uh, that that's something that if you want to collaborate to a project and you are absolutely new, uh, that's okay. That's totally fine. So we would actually love to see a lot of people copying and pasting our, our commit logs if they are going to to help us to achieve some goals. Because well, I personally I, I I did that at the at the beginning of my career in the kernel, so I did it once and it was fun. <laughs> um, okay, we have an issue tracker. Uh, al along the way, when, when we are trying to to complete bigger tasks, I think it it could sound familiar to you that uh, along the way you run into more issues and more problems. And you, all of a sudden, you wanted to complete a couple of tasks. Well, now you have like a, a dozen of them, right? So we need a place where we could keep track of all those issues that we were finding along the way. And well, sometimes that's also useful to extensively document uh, some changes uh, before before we uh, we send a pull request or we send a patch uh, to the, for, for the documentation subsystem. And, and this extensive document is is added, right? And it is taken as, as something official. So in the case of uh, we were doing, or we, we have been doing uh, replacement of uh, zero length and one element arrays with flexible arrays. Um, in the case of the zero, zero length arrays, those are fair, fair, very big mechanical changes. So however, at the beginning, when we were trying to land those changes, well, people were, were asking, okay, but what's the point of replacing, uh, of sending this one line patch uh, and replacing this zero length? I mean, just removing the zero from the, from the array declaration. I mean, that's the same, the structure, uh, the size of the structure containing this array uh, is the same, so what's the point? We don't want your, your patches, right? So we had to come up with this huge document, uh, with all the explanation of the history behind one element arrays, the history behind zero length uh, arrays, and, and how uh, now, uh, in recent times, in C99, 
well, a new form of, of uh, dynamically sized array uh, was included in, in the C standard, which is uh, the flexible arrays. So, well, before uh, we, we needed to, to, uh, to have a place to, to place all that documentation, right? In the process of adding this documentation to, uh, to, to, the, official, to the official documents. And then something happened. Uh, I mean, I learned, I learned my, my lesson the hard way. Uh, I had this experience uh, with Linux when I was recently a maintainer and I had like uh, these uh, superpowers to send pull requests to Linux. Uh, I was, I, I guess, I, I implemented like uh, 20 of those uh, fairly simple replacements of, of zero length arrays with flexible arrays. So there I was with this one line code change and this 100 line commit log, right? And I was sending these patches uh, everywhere, right? So those patches were supposed to land at the same time in the same subsystem, so I didn't see a problem with that. I wanted people to have the complete explanation of what this changed, what was needed. <laughs> so then, well, of course, uh, at the beginning, those patches were completely ignored. So I had the idea, the idea that I was going to gather all those patches and, as, and I was going to create this amazing pull request to Linux and I was going to impress him, right? And well, yeah, I sent the pull request and actually this is not the answer that I received. I received another kind of answer, but this is like a, like a nice one. <laughs> and well, the, the problem is that, yeah, Linux actually merged my, my, my pull request but he merely noticed that he now had like a, this 2,000 line log, right? And he was pissed off and, and he decided to, uh, well, to just get rid of my pull request. And, but, well, the thing is that sometimes some maintainers really actually want to know everything, every possible thing that you can add to, to the commit log, they want to read it, right? And that happens to be the case of, uh, of Dave Miller. Is Dave here? Where is, where is they? No, he's not here. Hey, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, I found this on Twitter, um, and well, apparently at some point uh, they wanted to, to to know what you had for for breakfast, yeah, right, in, in your commit log. And when when I read that, that that actually made made sense to me because because yeah, I mean. If you are receiving, you are working on something, and then this other person come out of nowhere and he's trying to modify your code, uh, you should you should actually have like a, the whole explanation of, of why this change this change is needed, right? So that's totally fine to me. I mean, I'm, I'm totally okay with that. But well, apparently Linux doesn't care what you had for breakfast outside of that. <laughs> but thanks, Dave. Okay. Anyways. Uh, coverity. Well, coverity is not actually uh, for for hardening the Linux kernel. However, this is the way how I started uh, my career in the in the in the kernel community, and I particularly consider this tool an amazing tool for newcomers. I mean, there are different kinds of newcomers, right? So, newcomers that already have professional experience working in the C language will find it fairly easy to, uh, to start contributing to the kernel if they take a look at the, uh, at the scans that Coverity provides. So, well, just uh, quickly, uh, the name of the project is Linux Next Weekly. However, Case runs daily builds. So, in a daily basis, a new build is uploaded and you have this daily scan, this daily Coverity scan. Uh, why we still, why the project still have this name? Uh, well, the issue with that is when we contacted the community people, they told us, well, you already, uh, we, we already gave you a project. We're already uh, scanning uh, the Linux next project, so we don't, ga we don't want to have duplicated projects. So deal with it. So that's it. So, well, it's called Linux Next Weekly Scan, but it's actually a daily scan of, of Linux Next. And well, a little bit about Coxinel. Coxinel, we use Coxinel a lot, and it's, it's an amazing tool. However, it's not, not that magical. I mean, it is really helpful to find, uh, if we already know what we are looking for, and we already know that this, uh, this pattern, this idiom is buggy, and we want to find every instance, every possible instance in the whole code base, well, 
we could write a fairly simple and small uh, uh, coccinus script and we can find all the instances. The actual work is to, to go and, and take a look at every piece of code and determine what is going on, right? And if you actually can, can change that code or, or, or not. And here are some examples of uh, coccinus scripts we, we use. I mean, this is a, a fairly simple and small uh, script and it helped me to uh, well to get rid of all the remaining uh, zero length arrays we had in the code base after we already audited tons and tons of instances of this issue. Another example, another script is this one. Um, this one actually, uh, actually, uh, well, for those of you that are familiar with the stock size, um, we are we are trying to find uh, all these instances of code that fall into. Uh, these possible scenarios, right? So, at first, we wanted to find that pattern, that idiom that is so popular in the Linux kernel when, when you want to uh, to get the size uh, of a structure that contains a flexible array within, and you actually want to calculate the total size for for, uh, for the allocation of dynamic memory. Uh, that can be buggy, so we wanted to find all the instances of that of the of that piece of code and look at it and and evaluate if we could actually change it uh, and instead using the stroke size helper so this is a script that uh, if you run this script it will find all the all the remaining uh, instances of this of this issue so it's a simple script it's not that convoluted and is is quite useful Okay, now another tool we, we we regularly use is the uh, the services of the kernel test robot. Mm, this is supported by Intel, and well, the results are usually within 24 hours. And whenever we are implementing complex changes that actually need to uh, uh, actually need to be build tested in across multiple platforms and multiple multiple configurations. Uh, something that I usually do is to add uh, a build tested by tag with a link, with a public link to the results of, of the kernel test robot. So if you if you send an email to, to the robot, well, you can ask for your tree to be included, right? And, and it can be build tested. Yep. So I automatically get, uh, every time I push to uh, kernel.org, I get the thing. I was wondering, okay, so for the build tested by, you say you send an email, you have to let it go through and it'll, it will give you a build tested by. Do you know if it's automatic? So it's, I already have the testing. I was wondering, is there a possibility of getting that build tested by automatically because it tests it already? Um, I see, that's interesting. Yeah, I guess you can contact the, um, I, I, sh I well, I wonder if it should be by here? default because I always get an email saying you, you could, it's an opt-in where you opt-in and then after they success it, I'll get the success email. I, mean, I actually should look to see if it has a build tested by in that email. Um, but I just know I just like saying that no, it's, actually it's, it's not included. That what it has is uh, it, it says oh no no when it's successful I haven't seen an attack but when it fails it, it it tells you okay if you fix this issue please include this this yeah. reported by right no but it's, it's, I've, you've opt I, I've opted in to being told whenever it oh, succeeds I, I, I get an email I didn't know that yes oh, you really? can opt in you get, okay, so how, how do you do that well I, I just sent an email to I think the I said give me success reports oh well but, but by opting in I mean I, I thought you were saying that automatically if you had a way to opt in but, but you actually the, had to contact the people right I contacted the people to yeah. say yeah can you please send because they don't want to spam people oh, every time yeah so what I'm wondering is I don't know if it's still testify so I'm saying if I'm already getting an email back and I already did the testing I was really, I don't know well, maybe you're not the one to ask I guess I should ask them if they can get the build tested by on those automatic emails or on the emails that I'm already getting does that make sense uh, 
Just well, a question. So I was just wondering if you knew or not. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, well, as as Steve was saying, yeah, you can you can ask uh, the the admins of uh, of this project, and well, they can they can make uh, the results publicly available. So so yeah, you can you can be able to include a link and and uh, and, and maintainers can see the results, right? Um, this is uh, uh, an email saying that uh, well, the build was successful, and just to um, just to explain a little bit. Well, it tests uh, it tests across multiple arcs and configurations, and in this side you can see the results from Clang. These are from GCC. These are from Clang. This is recently. Uh, in the past, we only had um, um, results for uh, with Clang and x86 only. Now we uh, we have a lot more uh, architectures. And well, we have some. Uh, you want to hang out? Oh, well, those are the the IRC channels we use. Uh, we we regularly. You can contact us uh, in both the Linux handling and, and build uh, clan and clan build Linux. Um, Libera, Libera chat. Yeah. In and, and yeah, and that's that's the wiki too. Okay, well, now let's talk a little bit. What what does it take to harden the kernel? Well, really? <laughs> okay, well, yeah, yeah. Actually, I mean, as I was saying at the beginning, um, one thing is to uh, to have a, a downstream clone of the Linux kernel. And do whatever you want with it, and do as you please, and implement these convoluted and complex uh, security features or security hardening uh, stuff. And other thing, and completely, completely different scenario, is to try to land those changes upstream. It's, uh, it adds orders of magnitude uh, of work to to the same task, and and well. Usually, uh, when when people talk talk about security and software, uh, there is usually this this fantasy that uh, uh, I, I mean that, that people that do security stuff are some kind of uh, superior minds or rock stars or whatever. But actually, it's not that glamorous when when you are uh, trying to land like uh, hundreds of uh, of patches that people usually see with disregard. And that's something I'm going to expand a little bit uh, later on. And, and well, actually taking a look at the code and finding these 4,000 instances. I mean, we recently enabled uh, implicit fall through for Clang. And originally, we had 40,000 40, warnings. So we had to go through all the 40,000 warnings and try to see if we could uh, place a break or we could place a, a, a fault marking. Some people, uh, some people usually uh, send us an email and say, "Well, that's so silly. Why don't you address with that with a coxing script?" And yeah, but it's not that simple. I mean, we have we when we were doing this uh, this work, the implicit fault through work for GCC, we found actual bugs in the code, so we can. We can just do that. We can just do a mechanical change, and that's it. I mean, that would be uh, counterproductive for uh, the credibility of the project. So we actually have to do the job. And well, along the way, we have to develop some studies. I mean, in order to be successful uh, in the Linux kernel, in the upstream Linux kernel, you have to develop some strategies if you want to land a lot of patches, right? If you have this big goal. And, and you need to do a lot of cleanups, and you need to do a lot of uh, uh, mechanical changes. Somehow you have to persuade people. Somehow you have to convince people that that small and simple change is actually needed, even if they consider that a little bit of a burden. And well, that implies uh, doing a little bit of political work, right? I mean, 
persuasion, trying to convince people, trying to uh, uh, be being very careful on how we interact with people. Um, there are certain people in like everywhere, right? Like in every community, that well, they usually respond like uh, not in a nice manner. Uh, yeah, they. I don't know. Certainly, there are, there are people that you read the email and just you don't want to meet this person at a conference. Yeah, and and, and usually the, the problem with this is that we need to get the job done. We cannot just reply the same they reply to us. We need to be careful, even when we when, when we sometimes bite our tongues, right? And that's that's not actually right. I mean, it it shouldn't be that way, but well. And well, the same it's to convince people to talk to people. And of course, uh, there are some people that are very supportive. I mean, uh, at the beginning, when we were uh, trying out these strategies on how to land uh, apparently trivial changes that no nobody wanted, uh, well, we found great support, particularly from from Dave. Uh, he was taking a lot of patches uh, for the implicit fall through work. And that's how we actually managed to, to advance and to make some progress and to prove other people that, well, you know, we have done this work. So we are about to enable this, this, this option. So please help us. And well, as I was saying, we want to avoid friction. Friction is, I mean, uh, we need to be a little bit smarter, right? Uh, these goals are big. These goals are important. Uh, usually, we tend to see like uh, computers can be exploited, computers can be attacked, right? It's, it's so fun and cool to uh, run and exploit on this computer, on this device, yeah. But however, what not, what is not that common to realize is that uh, persons are people are actually. Uh, um, in danger of of actual attack through computers, right? So at the end of the day, ultimately, uh, that's what what is at uh, at stake, right? The security, uh, the security of, of people, right? Well, I want to uh, expand a little bit on enabling compiler options. Uh, recently, the strategy, one of the most successful strategies. And at the same time, complicated strategies that we have been following to improve the security of the kernel is to try to enable important compiler options. Well, recently uh, we managed to enable a rebounds. And well, it's, it's complex, right? It's uh, usually, in some cases, there are some compiler options that people decide to disable because, well, they see a lot of warnings, right? And they don't want to work on them. They don't want to take a look. They don't want to. They, they don't want to determine whether what they are seeing is an actual bug or is a false positive. Uh, the thing with that is that some of those warnings and some of those false positives usually lead us to to find corner cases in the code and corner cases in the compiler. So it's not that uncommon that along the way we we find some bugs for GCC or or for Clang. Right, and that that creates impact. I mean, if we uh, manage to fix a bug in the kernel and at the same time manage to fix the compiler at the same time, well, it means that a lot of other projects are going to be benefited from that. Right? So, I think that's that's great. And well, of course, why? Trying to enable compiler options, we we run into this 991 rule, right? Like, uh, yeah, uh, in order to uh, in order to get to the point, in order to get to get to that one percent where you are actually able to innovate, where you are actually able to implement this uh, amazing uh, amazing thing that maybe is going to make the headlines. Well, first, the 90 percent of the time you need to uh, complete small middle steps along the way, right? And deal with a lot of people that don't want to see your code and don't want just change your changes, right? So yeah, 
it's a lot of work, 90% of the time is frustrating at times, or most of the time. <laughs> but at the end of the day, that work, that 90% of, uh, of, of work, allows for trying to implement more, uh, more ambitious things, right? And it's important, and it's something that it has to be done, and that usually nobody wants to do, because it's hard. OK, well, now uh, let's talk a little bit quickly, because I'm running out of time, about some work in progress. Well, uh, is a is a recent uh, API that uh, Case, together with Kate Packer, uh, implemented. Uh, we are working on some flexible array transformations, and we are still addressing array bounds because even when we enable this option, uh, it was enabled for GCC 11. However, uh, in the recent release of GCC 12, uh, well, apparently they improved uh, their bounds checking stuff, and well, now we got like a 150 new warnings. And well, MemCPI, uh, the hardening of MemCPI. Okay, it's two group, quickly. Okay, uh, usually, um, the, the, well, the two group is supposed to be used uh, to wrap adjacent members uh, in the same structure that somehow uh, are going to be accessed, or are going to be uh, some data is going to copy into them uh, using memcpi, memcopy, or memset uh, at once, right? So the problem with that is that, well, you are actually uh, crossing the boundaries of objects. So we want to avoid that. So in this case, if you have to do that, that's totally fine as long as you uh, use a struct group and what the struct group does. And I'm going to, to show a little bit. Well, uh, what, what it does is um, it, it inside it has an anonymous union with a couple of structures. Those structures say, share the same memory layout. One of them is named, and the other one is uh, anonymous. Why? Because if you want, you actually need to copy data across multiple members in the same structure. Well, now you can use the name of a structure instead of using the first object and just telling the, the, the just writing code to write past that object, right? So you just use the name of the structure, and then you can actually copy data into the whole thing, and you are not going to get any warning from uh, from MemCPI or, or MemSet. And well, the reason for that, uh, well, the flexibility of the language is, is a whole thing. Uh, we can have our like a, a whole conversation talking about the flexibility of the C language and why the flexibility of the, of the C language is one of the most important features of the C language and is, if not the most important feature and why the, the language is, has been so successful. But at the same time, the flexibility of the C language is uh, its uh, Achilles skill. Uh, because, well, C, one of the guiding principles of C is uh, to trust the programmer. And that's a mistake. <laughs> and the other guiding principle is to provide the developer with whatever it needs, whatever they need, in order to get the job done, right? So if you want to cross across, if you want to, uh, to store data across boundaries, yeah, sure, if you need that, that's okay. But that's actually not. Okay, well, um, the reason for, for, the, for the warnings was because uh, Fortify source is now uh, had an update uh, like a year ago, and well now uh, internally Fortify source uses this uh, compiler's built-in object size, right? And what it does is well, it has two two options. Uh, if you use uh, built-in object size with a pointer uh, to the object and zero, you are going to uh, to get all the size. Of the of the whole structure in which this object is contained, right? And if you use object building object size uh, with, with with an argument of one, well, you are going to get actually the boundaries of that object only, right? So that allows for uh, hardening the bounds checking of objects. Well, you can see more details of that commit. And, well, 
this is actually an example. Uh, if you see there, uh, we are trying to access uh, the member array, and we and if we use the zero as an argument, we are going to get as a result uh, 22 bytes, which is what we have from array to the end of the structure. But if we use uh, the array in uh, one as an argument, we only are going to get the size of that object, and that's what we want. And, and, and then, well, when you try to do this, when you try to cross across boundaries, well, you are going to get a compiler error. And well, yeah, this is what I was talking about, the internals of uh, struct group, the anonymous union with an anonymous uh, struct, a structure and a name uh, structure. Okay, these are uh, some examples of, uh, of the use of the stroke size on field. So there, uh, originally, I don't know, you, can you see, can you see the code in red? Is it clear to you? Or do you have uh, problems? No, right? I cannot see it. <laughs> okay. Anyways, well, the problem is that um, here in red is a main set, and that main set is trying to uh, uh, to set to zero uh, from all the thing entries in Mac objects, right? And that's an error. That uh, that triggers an error. And now, if you use uh, the struct group, you are creating, you are, you are naming, uh, you are enclosing entries entries in Mac within this new sectors structure. And now you can access sector, and that's totally fine. Now we don't get a warning because we know you you want to do that, right? And well, before stroke group, this is how we used to do things before having this uh, new uh, this new API. Well, we basically uh, were copying directly the the structures when possible, and this is another way where we were trying to address these issues. Well, instead of, of, of having an, om an anonymous structure to, together with a nameless structure, we created, we, uh, we, we, we just added this new structure. And the problem with that is that the code, uh, well, becomes a little bit verbose and it's not, it's not, uh, it's not the base, it's not the best solution. And well, these are uh, some uh, um, APIs related to a group. We, ha we can have attributes, and we can have, uh, we can have tags. Okay, now flexible array transformations. Um, well, uh, there is a, um, historically, um, there are some cases in which, well, we need to use a trailing array in, in, in a structure, and that trailing array, we need it to be uh, of variable or dynamically variable size, right? So some tricks were used, right? The ancient way of doing that is uh, is when, with a one element array, which is actually which is valid C, but uh, well, it's it's been abused. And the old way, the more recent uh, one of the more recently that, that um, more recent that, that the one element array is to use a zero length array. That's uh, actually not valid C, but it's a uh, GNU extension. So uh, now the modern way uh, that was added in C99 is a flexible array member, which is uh, an array uh, uh, just with an, with an empty empty space. Okay, well, as I was saying, uh, one element, zero, a zero element array, which actually it, it is, that is wrong, it should say zero length array, uh, it's a GNU extension, and one element array was basically a hack. And well, now zero element arrays and uh, zero length arrays and one element arrays are deprecated. Uh, that's the that's the link where you can see why they are deprecated. And well, those transformations are, are tricky. And I have introduced bugs, and fortunately, I I found them like uh, months before when I fixed them. And well. This is usually how uh, um, the use of uh, one LM array looks like. I'm going to go quickly because I'm running out of time, right? Yeah, I have a lot of information. Anyways, we can talk a little bit more about this later on. Okay, yeah, this is how uh, we usually implement a flexible array now. Uh, now, with the new, with the hardening of MEMS API, 
the use of flex or the flexible array structure is not longer needed because well meant uh, is helping us with that I'm sorry um, and well now it, it turns out that uh, we realize that uh, the compilers were treating all trailing arrays as flexible arrays so it doesn't matter if we have a flexible array, an actual flexible array, or we, we have an array of size 100. Uh, the compiler, uh, the compilers, GCC and Clang, uh, treat that as a flexible array. So in the case when we uh, when we updated uh, Fortify source, that becomes a problem because now we actually uh, the compiler tells us that it doesn't know what's the actual size of a size trailing array. Which is a problem. Okay, uh, on, on array bounds, well, yeah, they were uh, the the compiler option was enabled for G, for GCC 11. Now in GCC 12, we have uh, 153 new warnings that we are addressing now. That's the that's the issue on the pull tracker. You want to help us with this? And of course, uh, this uh, uh, enabling this option uh, has allowed us to find bugs. This is just a short list, uh, and there is a link of a discussion that Case was having with with some some person. And um, well, other work. Um, well, finally, well, we are making some progress uh, by fixing uh, string operations overflows. Uh, we enable implicit full true for Clang. We had 40,000 uh, warnings of this. That's crazy. Um, and well, we recently enabled cast function type. Actually, Steven uh, helped us to uh, fix the last uh, problems. So we, we managed to enable that option. And I want to reflect quickly a little bit on, on hardening men CPI and the compound effect. Well, this is a simplification of the hardening of men CPI. Uh, just to illustrate uh, which which part of the code is where uh, where we catch the the, the the errors at compile time and where we catch them at runtime, this was only possible because over three years, maybe more, we have been replacing one element arrays and, and zero length arrays with flexible arrays, and we have been addressing every uh, array bounds warning that we found. And it doesn't matter to us if that warning is in test code or in old code that nobody uses. If we need to fix that, and that's uh, in the way, uh, if that gets in the way, and we need to fix that in order to enable a compiler option, we need to address any issue. So uh, for us, it doesn't matter actually uh, the, the origin of that code, right? Or where, or where that code lives. That, that code lives. Um, if it's in the kernel, we have to fix it, and we make uh, everything possible to fix it. How you can help? Well, doing flexible array transformations, of course. It's, there is an issue there, so you can take a look. And, uh, and actually, in that issue, uh, you, you're going to find a list of uh, hundreds of, of patches. So you are, going to you are going to find hundreds of examples of how to do this work. Um, and well, of course, uh, you can help us to audit instances where we can replace the stroke size, uh, use a stroke group, and the size uh, size t saturating helpers. Uh, so yeah, take a look at the, at the issue tracker. We have issues for everybody. Yeah, this is just uh, an explanation on some things that you have pay attention with doing uh, flexible array transformations. So yeah. Just take a look uh, at the uses of size of when you use a size of on the container structure. Also, take a look uh, on the uses of size of on the on the actual uh, type of the array. And usually, when one element arrays, you are going to find that that pattern, uh, the n uh, minus one, which means that you are subtracting something from the uh, from in the calculation. That should be changed to n because Differently to what uh, to, to a zero length array or a flexible array, if you include a one element array in a structure, it affects the size of the structure. So it affects the size of the structure uh, by the size of the of one element of the type of the array, which doesn't happen for uh, uh, doesn't happen for uh, zero length arrays or flexible arrays. Okay, so we need to verify 
that the, the, the calculation of the size for the allocation is uh, con some, somewhat consistent uh, with the, um, within the, w w with the iteration uh, over the array, right? So we have to look for places where we iterate over the array and make sure that we are not out of boundaries, comparing uh, the actual size of the allocation. So anyways, if you or anyone seeing this presentation out there uh, want to give it a try, just uh, CC me and uh, I can review the patch. And well, these are just examples of um, vanilla array transformations. Conclusions, quickly. Okay. Well, um, what would be the best outcome? Well, the best outcome would be to, of course, eliminate classes of bugs and methods of exploitation, right? That's the ultimate goal. That's the big goal we have. And uh, we are steady and slowly making progress towards that. Uh, political work, we have been doing some political work. We have persuading people, we have talking to people, we have uh, convincing people. Uh, at times, we have... Uh, I know it is a confront people uh, in person, asking them, okay, why are you not taking these patches? Well, they tell us, well, you know, I am deliberately ignoring your patches. The issue with that is that we have to understand that we all are part of a community. And it's totally okay for every, uh, every small group in the, within the community to have their own opinions. It's fine. But at the end of the day, if you see, uh, if you are seeing that the community is speaking, well, you have to comply. Um, unless you have a really, 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 really a strong uh, uh, argument, right? Anyways, you comply. Okay. And well, a committed at a time. Yeah, we are making progress slowly and steady. And uh, every small patch uh, is important. Even if, it, if, in, if, if, the, if the task is, uh, is small, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is simple to implement. Is usually, uh, it demands a lot of work, it demands a lot of time, it's exhausting, it's time consuming, but it's worth it. And well, we hope that uh, the work we have been doing uh, during these years, we have been doing this work like, a, well, it's, it, it was created in 2015, I joined in 2017, well, it has like seven years now. Well, we actually hope that all the work we have been doing uh, benefits new people, because new people is important. Uh, Again, there is this uh, wrong narrative around new people and newcomers. We need, we need new people. We need newcomers, right? And we need to understand what I said before. There are different kinds of newcomers, different types of new people. Well, maybe we, ha we have to find those, those, those new people that are useful for the, for the project, right? And, well, yeah, another thing to mention is that uh, at the end of the day, the kernel is useful for billions of people, right? And a lot of companies uh, make profit out of, out of the kernel. And well, those companies need to consider funding some efforts on improving the security of the kernel. It's not glamorous stuff, of course, but it's absolutely needed. There is a link uh, down there uh, of a blog post from Case Cook, so it's interesting to read. And with that, thank you. No time, for, no time for questions. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm going to just ask you when you been telling me this whole time that you have not enough work to do and you're looking for more. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's what you get out of this. <laughs> uh, believe it or not, the likely unlikely tracer that I have. That's, I, you know, I like to run it, and every December I'll set my machine to turn on. There's a likely unlikely uh, profiler, actually. It tells you all the places that there's a like, likely code, you know, the branch, for branches, and it tells you how much they're right, they're wrong. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of time, like I do a lot of places where they're not right. I mean, it's like 100% incorrect, so yeah, unlikely, which causes slowdowns and stuff like that. But there's a few times where I brought this up, um, and the, the author said, wait a minute. This code should never be hit, and they actually found bugs in the code because of by the likely unlikely. They thought 
something that they thought was supposed to be done was being done, and they actually fixed the code to solve that. So, as I say, if you know, like this might be for newcomers too. I could run. I run every Wednesday, like I said, December. I run the thing, to find it. I just haven't had time to analyze it. I always tell people who do look at it, don't just blindly say, "Oh, the unlikely, unlikely is wrong," or, or it's, it's exactly. always wrong. Yeah. You can't do that. You have to have a reason why. Some, there's, sometimes there's legitimate reasons why it's always wrong. Yeah. Uh, so you can't. You actually have to find out why. Once you find out why, see if there's a bug and say, well, "I don't understand why is this always wrong." Or basically ask. So that's just another one thing you might. Want to yeah, think absolutely. About. Yeah, you can send me an email with that. Okay. Please. Hi, you mentioned coccinelle transformations uh, in your talk. I was wondering, if you do a coccinelle transformation, fix all instances of it, how are you preventing the same pattern from being introduced again in future patches? Well, yeah, th that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a whole problem because actually there are, uh, there are a number of uh, scripts uh, in the upstream kernel, uh, coccinelle, coccinelle scripts, that are fine actual, actual bugs, but we need people to run them. The problem with that is always that uh, there are a lot of false positives too, right? So that's a problem. Uh, with with the static analyzers in general, that's the main that's the main issue, and that's why we need actual people to spend the time and to take a look and to take the time uh, of, of reviewing all those all those uh, all those errors or warnings that you might get, right? All those all, all the reports of all those instances of code. Yeah, that's a problem. I mean, we need we need people to run it. I mean, every now and then I I do it. At the beginning, when I started doing this work, I I was doing that regularly, and I found uh, some 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 important cases. Actually, due to uh, one of the scripts I run, that is actually in the Linux kernel, we found this tautological compare uh, problem that then was fixed in Clang like uh, uh, three years ago, in that same that same pattern was found in the in the compiler itself, and, and yeah, and, and we and we somehow helped to fix an issue in the compiler, and now we have an option uh, thanks to that coccinelle script, thanks to that thanks to that finding, we have we have this new uh, tautological compare option in Clang, and actually I like a couple of weeks ago or almost a month, I filed an, a bug for GCC for the same problem. Because I noticed that they actually they don't they, they, they are failing to find that same bug. So the idea is after you fixed all instances using Coxnell, you want a compiler warning for the same pattern for future reference. In some cases, mm -hmm. yeah, when, when when possible, right? That that that's ideal. That's the that's awesome. That's great. I mean, but that's that not happens regularly, but it does happen. Uh, so I've done very, very similar work in the past, and I think uh, what I also kind of consider a bug fix, if you audit code and find out that the code is correct, but you still use hours figuring that out, the bug fix would be to add a comment explaining why it is correct. But I found out that getting such patches are stream is totally part of the, you, you totally enter the uh, non-glamorous uh, po political work because it's, they are even hard upstream. But I think for me, for my vision, that's also a bug fix because it saves other people. You spend hours and I don't want to see that wasted. So I, uh, and I want to see that waste. So uh, I think adding a command, so yes, it is, it's complicated code, but it's correct. So I think that's also worth adding. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and for that we need new people. I mean, th there is something that uh, I have heard Greg saying at some point. Sometimes people with blind ambitions is really useful. I mean, they are going to spend time taking a look at the code. That's how I actually started. Yeah. Okay, thank you.